Good morning. Welcome to New Key Baptist Church on this Lord's Day for our online sermon. This morning we will be continuing our series in the book of Nahum by looking at Nahum chapter 3 and the theme of My Coming Judgment Day. So if you have your Bibles, could you please turn to the book of Nahum and let us hear God's word from chapter 3. Nahum chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city! It is full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great multitude of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sells the nations through her harlotries and the families through her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than no Ammon that was situated by the river, that had the waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was boundless. Put and Lubbam were your helpers. Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young also were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. They cast lots for her. Honourable men and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You will also seek refuge from the enemy. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Surely your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. Draw water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the clay and tread mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will eat you up as a locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locust. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. Your commanders are like swarming locusts. And your generals like great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away, and the place where they are is not known. Your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains, and no one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you, for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? This is God's word. Let us pray. Oh, our God and our Father, as we come this morning to hear from your word, we do ask that you would speak to us, that, Lord, we would hear all that you have to say, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the things of truth, that, Lord, we would embrace your word. That, Lord, as we consider the issue of Judgment Day and our own state, I do pray that you would cause us to consider the Lord Jesus Christ. Please be with me as I preach. May I know the liberty of the Spirit that only comes from you. And may I be faithful to proclaim the word of God. We pray these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, this morning we come to the conclusion of our short series in the book of Nahum. 
And as we have walked through this prophecy concerning Nineveh, we have seen over and over again the truth that God will judge wickedness. We see that Nineveh has turned its back upon God. Nineveh has slapped away the hand of grace that has been extended to her, and now judgment is assured. Yet one of the dangers that you and I face when we study prophecies like this is that we can easily focus upon the judgment and the sins that will fall upon Nineveh to the point where we forget about our own sin. It is very easy for us to shake our head and go tut, tut, tut to Nineveh because of all of its sins and all of its vices. But the moment we start to sit in judgment over Nineveh because of their wickedness, all we are doing is playing the hypocrite. Because just like Nineveh, we too deserve the judgment of God. Now sometimes we can focus so much on the sins and the wrongs of others that we end up forgetting that we too are sinners in the sight of God. Uh, a few years ago, there was a man who worked for a bill collection company in a large retail outlet. He was interviewed by a news media asking him what it was like to work in his department. And this man said that one of the hardest parts of his work was constantly getting notes from people who had not paid their bills. Notes from people who said, I know you have others who owe more than I do. Go after them. Leave me alone. And this bill collector pointed out that those who were complaining about their bills were missing the point completely. The issue wasn't that others owed more than they did. The issue was that they owed something. That they were in debt. So when we look at Nineveh, when we see the sins of Nineveh, we cannot say, well, I thank God I'm not like them. I thank God I don't deserve judgment. Because that simply isn't true. The same God who looks at Nineveh and judges Nineveh for her sins is the same God that looks at you and me. He is the same God who hears every word that we speak and who sees all the deeds that you and I have done in darkness. God knows all. He looks at us and he sees our sins. And the Bible says he will judge you and I. And just like Nineveh, we have a day of judgment rapidly approaching. And what I want to do this morning is I want us to look at some of the sins of Nineveh. I want us to see what brought the judgment of God upon Nineveh. And as we do that, I want us to see that in reality we are no better. That we are just as guilty as sinning against God as the Ninevites were. This morning I would challenge everyone listening to do what the Apostle Paul said to do. In 2 Corinthians 13.5 when he said, examine yourself, test yourself. As we look at the sins of Nineveh and the decree of judgment upon them, examine yourself to discover if you, like Nineveh, are heading Towards judgment. So let us begin by looking in verses 1 to 4 of the sins of Nineveh. Now, this final chapter of the prophecy against the city of Nineveh begins with God saying, Woe. He's pronouncing woe upon the city. In other words, God is speaking of the terrible and certain day of judgment that is going to fall upon them. You see, Nineveh had a day fixed where the judgment of God was going to fall upon them. And we would do well to remember that God has fixed a day when all people, young and old, rich and poor, will all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at that great throne of judgment. And even though we are looking at a prophecy directly relating to a city, what we need to keep in mind is that cities are made up of individuals. Cities themselves don't get judged. It's the individuals in the city that bring about the sin, that bring about the judgment. And it's the individuals that make up that city that brings God's wrath upon them. 
So when we see Nineveh being judged, realize that we are dealing with people like you and I who had sinned against God. But what were the sins that Nineveh was committing? Well, we've already seen through the previous chapters that one of the big aspects, one of the big sins that Nineveh was committing was that they had turned their back on God. They had forsaken the truth. This city and the people of this city once knew the truth. They had heard the preaching of the gospel, but they turned away from it. Uh, They would be much like people in our day and age who were brought up in Christian homes. People who had their mum and their dad read the Bible to them. People who heard the word of truth but chose to ignore it and did not apply it to their lives. Nineveh is much like those people that come to chapel week in and week out. They hear the preaching of God's word. They hear the gospel call to repent and believe in Jesus. But they won't heed that call. Nineveh had heard the gospel. But they rejected the truth. They turned their back on the light and instead they ran towards the darkness. Yet as we go to chapter 3, we actually see some of the specific deeds of darkness that Nineveh engages in. The common sins that this city engaged in, I dare say, are still common in our society today. If we look closely at the sins mentioned here, and if we examine ourselves, we may even see that these very sins that brought the judgment of God upon Nineveh are also sins that are in our heart. Notice in verse 1, God begins his pronouncement of woe by saying that Nineveh is a bloody city. That is, it is a violent city. Now, how violent were the Ninevites? Well, verse 3 gives us an indication. Verse 3 says, Horsemen charge with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Now that's a vivid description of violence that was common amongst the Ninevites. It was a violent and bloody city. There were piles of dead bodies just lying around. Now a few years ago I was invited to go and preach in Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I was invited to come to a series of evangelistic events. But before I left I did some research into the city and I discovered that Port Moresby was listed as one of the top 10 most dangerous cities in the world. Yet even though I spent a week there travelling throughout the city preaching and I saw crime and violence, I didn't see what is described in Nineveh. I didn't see the slain in the street. I didn't see bloated and rotting corpses laying in the road. Even though Port Moresby was violent, it wasn't as violent as Nineveh. You see, the description we have here of Nineveh speaks to us of just how much bloodlust the people of Nineveh had. If we were to step back and examine Nineveh in the light of God's law, if we were to bring God's Ten Commandments to bear, we would have to say that Nineveh was in violation of the Sixth Commandment. You shall not murder. And as a result of these great evils that Nineveh committed, God was against them. In Proverbs 6, 16 to 17, we are told that God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. And that describes Nineveh perfectly. They shed blood. They were a bloody and violent city. And God is against them. He has a holy anger towards them. But let's personalise it for a moment. While it is true that you and I don't run around killing people, could we still be described as a bloody and violent people? Could someone describe you that way? The Bible says that if we hate people, then the eyes of God, we are guilty of murder already in our heart. The Lord Jesus said if we are angry without cause, then we are in danger of the judgment. So are you a violent person in thought or in deed? 
Are you a violent person in action or thought? Nineveh was violent. And so often, so are we. But the next sin that God calls out for Nineveh is that they are a city full of lies. Nineveh had a reputation of not being trustworthy. The city and its officials would often make agreements with other cities and other nations, and then they would break those agreements. They would lie constantly. Again, if we were to bring the Ten Commandments to bear, we would see that Nineveh violated the ninth of the Ten Commandments. They told lies. They didn't tell the truth. They twisted things to suit themselves. And just like God is against murder, the Bible says that God who is true is also against falsehood. He's against lying. In Proverbs 6, 17, God says he hates the lying tongue. In Revelation 21, verse 8, we are told that all liars, those who tell lies, will have their part in the lake of fire. Search your heart this morning. Is this sin of lying common in your life? Do you always tell the truth? Or do you tell lies? God brings about judgment on Nineveh because they are liars. He calls their actions sinful and he says he is against them. Do you tell lies? Now perhaps you sit there going, well, I've never been caught for lying, so is it really that big a deal? Yes. Be sure your sin will find you out. Lying is a big deal and eventually you will be judged for it. I recently read a court transcript of a trial in the US where a man was standing before the judge facing charges for numerous offences that he had allegedly committed. This man throughout the trial maintained his innocence. The, the prosecutors brought in evidence, they showed evidence after evidence after evidence to prove he was guilty, but this man kept maintaining that he was not guilty. And for some reason, the judge bought this man's lies. The judge believed the, the man who was accused, so he let him go free. And as that man was leaving the courtroom, he said to the judge, Thank you, Your Honour, I will no longer do those things which I have been charged with today. See, the lie came out right at the end. Truth was revealed and it ended up bringing the full force of the law upon him. Our lies, while they may never be caught by other people, are known by God. They are seen by God. And God says lying lips are an abomination in his sight. So do you tell lies? But as we move on in Nahum chapter 3, we see that Nineveh is also being judged because they were thieves. Robbery was common in the city. Again, this is a violation of the Ten Commandments. Commandment number 8 says, do not steal. Uh, the Ninevites would take things that didn't belong to them. They plundered whatever they could. We've already seen in Nahum chapter 2 that they would plunder and pillage the people of God. They were thieves. They were robbers. Oh, what about you? Are you a thief? Do you take things that don't belong to you? The size of the item taken does not matter. The question is, have you taken something that belongs to someone else? Theft is a serious matter. I have heard from several shop workers here in the UK that due to the shortage of police and the increase of shoplifting, police will now no longer respond to theft of items under a certain value. As a result, there are now gangs of criminals going around who steal right up to the limit. They get to the limit, but they never cross that line because they know the police will ignore them. Well, God is not like those policemen. God promises to judge all theft, with him saying in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10, to that thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. Nineveh stole things. Have you? And now if we drop down to verse 4, we see another sin that Nineveh was engaged in. We see that they were engaged in sexual sin. God describes the people of Nineveh as being a seductive harlot. Now what was happening in Nineveh was that 
People would take the gift of sex, which is a good gift from God, and much like people in our culture, they would pervert that gift. You see, God as king, as lord, as sovereign, as the creator, gave sex as a beautiful gift to be used within the confines of marriage, between one man and one woman for life. But what the Ninevites did, and what our culture does, is that they ignored God. They twisted and perverted the gift that God has given. And this is a violation of the seventh commandment, which says you shall not commit adultery. You see, sex before marriage is sinful. Sex outside of the marriage covenant is also sinful. It's called adultery. Before marriage, fornication. After marriage, adultery. And in Hebrews 13.4, God says he will judge the sexually immoral. He will judge all adulterers and fornicators. You see, in our society, sexual sin is rampant. Instead of sex being used within marriage, it is taken and is used incorrectly. It is perverted through pornography and other vices. And that is why the Lord Jesus says that if you look upon someone you're not married to with sexual desire, then all you are doing is breaking the seventh commandment. You are committing adultery in your heart. We must be alert to this sin. God judges Nineveh for its sexual perversions. But there's one more sin that God mentions here in Nahum, Nahum chapter 3. And that is the sin of idolatry. Now we've previously mentioned this, that Nineveh embraced paganism. They worshipped false gods. They served idols. This is a violation of the first and second of the Ten Commandments. They bowed down to idols and served pieces of wood and stone and gold instead of worshipping the Creator. They were idol worshippers. And God judges them for that. Now, while you and I may not bow down to physical idols, it must be noted that you and I still can have idols in our lives. We can have idols in our mind and in our heart. Anything we love more, anything we are focused on more than Jesus Christ, is an idol. Christ must be number one in all our affection. He must be first in all our desires. But the truth is, none of us have loved God in this manner. All of us are guilty of idolatry. This is why the judgment of God is coming upon Nineveh. And this is why the judgment of God comes upon people today. And this is why the judgment of God will come upon you and me who are not trusting in Jesus. Now you may hear of all these sins and perhaps you're thinking that the, the many sins that you've committed and normally what happens when we start to think about our sin is that our natural response is to try and reason it away. Well, sin wasn't that big a deal. It never hurt anyone, did it? And we try to reason our sin away, but it is a big deal and it's something we must deal with. Uh, let me illustrate just how dangerous sin can be by pointing you to a certain type of alligator. Uh, there is this small alligator which isn't really good at hunting and pulling down its victims. So what this alligator does is that it goes up to the water's edge of a river, it submerges most of its body, but then it opens its mouth. And it sits perfectly still. Now over time, animals come down to the water's edge. They drink. Lizards come along and they actually paddle around in the water that is actually the mouth of the alligator. They drink, they eat, they lave by the water. They hop in the alligator's mouth, but they don't see the danger that they are in. Life's one big party for them. It's no big deal, the danger they're in. But then all of a sudden, the whole party comes to an end as the jaws shut tightly. And that is what sin is like. Sin, while we may not see it as a big deal, while we may not see it as dangerous, and even though right now you might be enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, what you and I need to realise is that one day the jaws will snap shut and will be taken off to judgment. We'll be taken off to stand before God to give an account of all our sin. And we see the certainty of judgment here in verse 5 to 19. 
There is a certainty of judgment. Judgment for sin is assured. And the reason it is assured is because God is holy. The holy God who is good and just must punish wrongdoing. If he didn't, then he would not be good and he would not be just. So God, the Holy One, says to Nineveh that because of your sin, judgment is going to come upon you. And he then engages in descriptive language to explain what this judgment is going to look like. He says that the people of Nineveh will have their nakedness exposed. In other words, everything they have done will be brought to light. But not only will they be exposed, God says he will throw filth at them and they will be ashamed because of their sins. Now to support the certainty of this coming judgment, God actually points to a historical account. He points back to a city and says, remember the city of No Amon. Remember that city. Remember No Amon. In verse 8, he says, You remember that great city, No Amon, that strong city, that mighty city? I cast that down. No Amon, or as we would know it, Thebes was a mighty and great city. It was a strong city, it had defenses, it was much like Nineveh. But it fell. And the irony is that this untakeable city was actually taken by the Assyrians, by the Ninevites. And God says, just like they fell and were destroyed, so will you. And what we can learn from this example of Nineveh and this warning that God gives, is that God will bring judgment upon all people for their sin. Judgment for all sin. Everything will be revealed. Everything we have done in darkness will be brought to light. Every thought and deed and word will be brought into the open. Everyone will see it because God has seen it. He will bring it to light and the judgment will be open. God exposes the sin of Nineveh. And he promises to expose the sin of people on the day of judgment. Imagine how terrible that will be. Imagine if we could set up a screen here in the chapel and on that screen we were able to project for all to see everything you've said, every deed you've done, every thought that's crossed your mind. Imagine if we put on a show and said we're going to show your thought life. How would you feel? I'd be ashamed, I'd be embarrassed, I wouldn't want my sin exposed like that. Yet that is exactly what is going to happen on the judgment day. Our nakedness will be laid bare. We will be exposed. Our sin will be revealed. All the evil we have done will be brought to light and judgment will come upon us. How will you go on that day? Now Nineveh, what they did is they heard of the coming judgment and what they did was retreat back to their defences. They trusted in the strongholds of their city. Yet the best defences of humanity cannot stop the judgment. As God says in verse 12, All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. And God is saying to the city, Your best defences is like a tree laden with fruit. I give it a shake and it all falls down. Your best will not stop the judgment of God. Now it is common for us to respond like Nineveh when we hear about our sin and the coming judgment. When we see our sin and we realise that we rightly deserve the judgment of God, what people naturally do is they try to build up their strongholds. They try to build up their defences. That They start to appeal to their good deeds. They hope that their best efforts will stop the judgment of God. Perhaps some will build a stronghold of religious works. They will say, well, I better pray more. I better read my Bible more. I better be baptized. I, I better go to church. I better sing hymns. I better be religious. But the best strongholds of our good deeds and our good works are nothing. They will collapse before the God who judges sin. You see, nothing we can do will defend us from the wrath that is to come. And that's how the book of Nahum finishes. Nineveh, you're done for. 
Nothing you can do will stop the judgment of God. You cannot rescue or save yourself. And Nahum finishes with that heavy statement. But even though this book of Nahum finishes with this lack of hope for Nineveh, I want us to finish our series with a tone of hope. You see, where Nineveh ended up was not where they had to end up. Hope had been extended to them earlier, but they rejected it. You see, Nahum sounds the warning to Nineveh. And indeed, he sounds a warning to you and I about the coming judgment. The sins that we commit say that we should be judged just like Nineveh was judged. But what we have to realise is that Nineveh actually had a way of escape from the judgment. If they had turned to God, if they had trusted in Him, then they would have been safe. But they chose not to. Nineveh rejected the only way of salvation. And we too have a way of escape from the judgment that is to come. We have the Lord Jesus Christ who has come to this earth to rescue us. Our sin, my sin, your sin, says we deserve death and judgment. But the Lord Jesus came to this earth and he went to the cross to absorb the full wrath and judgment that our sin demanded. Jesus took the full judgment which his people deserved. He hung naked on the cross. He was exposed. He endured mockery and shame. He had our sin placed upon himself. So he appeared as filth. He took the judgment we deserve because he loves us. Because he loves us. He absorbs the judgment. He pays the penalty for sin. He was judged on behalf of sinners because he loves you and is willing to forgive you. Jesus died openly and in shame because of our sin. He was then buried in the grave. But three days later, he rose again from the dead. He defeated death and he paid the full price of judgment. And now, Christ would hold out his hand to you. He offers you a pardon. He offers you forgiveness of all your sin. It doesn't matter what you have done. If you would take the hand of Jesus, if you would trust in him this morning, if you would turn from your sin and believe in Christ, then you will be completely forgiven. Young and old, have you been to Jesus? Have you trusted in Him? God provides rescue from the coming judgment. And that rescue is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, do not slap His hand of grace away. Rather, take hold of it by faith and say, Lord, Please save me. Lord, please forgive me. Oh, right now, wherever you are, take the hand of Jesus and trust in him. Flee from the wrath that is to come by fleeing to Jesus. Nineveh slapped the hand of grace away. And they went to judgment. Today, Christ offers his hand. He says, I will rescue you. Turn from your sin. Come to me. Trust in me. And you'll be completely rescued. This book of Nahum warns us of the judgment. But it also points us to hope. The hope of Jesus Christ. The hope of rescue. Not through deeds I have done but the hope of rescue through the love of God towards sinners in which Christ died for us and rose again. So today, turn from your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified but risen Saviour who took the penalty for sin.
Let's pray. Oh, our God and our Father, we thank you for the reminder of your word that you are holy and good and just, and as such, you must punish wrongdoing. Lord, we are aware that our sin makes us worthy of death and judgment, but we are so thankful this day for the Lord Jesus Christ, who bled and died in the place of sinners. The Lord Jesus Christ, who took our judgment. Oh, Father, today may we all grab a hold of Jesus. May we all hold on to him. And may we follow the Saviour who took the full wrath that we deserve. And may we declare him as Lord. Oh, be honoured, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.